Father, again, we just come to you, Lord, just asking, as you've encouraged us in your word to do, as we just heard, to ask, Lord, that we might receive from you today, that your word might speak into our hearts, that we might be refreshed and motivated, maybe refocused, Lord. And so we turn our minds and our hearts over to you, turn them over to your will, and we just ask that your spirit would speak, Lord, over this body and speak into each of our lives. And Lord, I just pray that we could hear and we'd be obedient to what we hear. So we thank you again for your presence with us. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry, Lord, that you do in our lives in the way that you care for us. So, Lord, we open our, your word now. We just ask simply that you would teach us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Covered the first two verses of this chapter last week. Have a little bit of a review, and then we'll carry through the rest of the chapter. Romans chapter 12. Let's look again at those first two verses. Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So with these two verses opening this chapter, we hear God compelling us to give back to him that which belongs to him. Now, as I said last Sunday, we went through these two verses and only these two verses. And so if you weren't here, I would uh, invite you to go back and listen to that teaching. There's a lot there for us. Very important verses, no matter where we lived in God's timeline, but I think extremely for these days. So the question is then, what belongs to God that he wants? Well, if you're a believer here this morning, then your life is what he wants. Because if you're a believer, your life belongs to him. A set of verses that we shared last week, and we're going to actually share a couple times today that I think are so important for this topic, and just as a general reminder, is where Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. He says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God says it's your reasonable service to him to set yourself apart for him, such that your life becomes a living sacrifice. Setting yourself apart for him includes conforming yourself to his image and to his purposes, not to any image or purposes the world might attempt to impose on you. Such an important thing, because right now, I think unlike any other time in history, the world is attempting to impose its image on you and to give you its purposes. And as I emphasized last week, and I'll emphasize again, as a child of God, as a follower of Jesus, as a blood-bought believer, you are to be a nonconformist, a nonconformist to the things of the world. And I think, as I said last week, and I'll say again, the last three plus years have proven to us the church has not learned that lesson. And we must be the difference. We must determine now in our hearts that we will not conform to the world unless the world is following God. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, he works within you and he transforms your mind and conforms you to his will for you. And God says all of this is accomplished by his mercies. So remember, the old covenant 
required the lifeblood of an unblemished animal to atone for sin, and the new covenant required the lifeblood of an unblemished man to atone for sin. That means both covenants, the old and the new, required death. They required blood. They required sacrifice. And when we consider these requirements for the atonement of sin, we realize that what was actually required was the lifeblood of the sinner. But God, gosh, I love those two words. But God, by his mercies, always supplied a substitute. Now, mercy is an expression of God's love in that he restrains from applying sin's penalty of death to those who deserve it. And here in the opening of this chapter, God's saying he wants the life that is owed to him. He wants the life he purchased on the cross when he became the substitutionary sacrifice, mercifully sparing you and I from paying the penalty for sin. And God said he's not asking you for a sacrifice unto death, but a sacrifice unto life. God's not requiring the death of our bodies. He's simply asking that the new life he placed in us by his blood be given back to him in the form of service and devotion and worship, such that his life is manifested in us and then through us to the world. Now, we can't go very far considering God's mercy without eventually coupling it to God's grace. Mercy and grace are the bookends to God's love. So as we continue now this week, Paul performs the coupling, the coupling of God's mercy with God's grace. We'll pick up in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So salvation comes at the intersection of man's faith and God's mercy and grace. And that intersection is transformational. That intersection represents the transformation from self-rule to God's rule over your life. And I'm going to read again from 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. As a believer, you know that you have been spared the requirement of your own life to atone for sin. Because God in his mercy fulfilled that requirement in Jesus at the cross for you. You also need to know that there is nothing special about you. How's that feel? There's nothing special about you that made you savable. There was nothing about your faith that raised you above another person with faith. Your faith was simply met by God's grace, which says you have not earned your position in me, but your faith is sufficient to gain my favor. Paul says, because of this, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And the language used here in the Greek says, don't be vain. Don't be arrogant. Do not esteem yourself. And I love how it, This says it, do not esteem yourself overmuch. That's one word, overmuch. Do not esteem yourself overmuch. Instead, it says you're instructed to think soberly. And that means to be sane, to have a sound mind. And as a believer, you should be cautious to never exaggerate your own importance. But at the same time, you shouldn't be envious of others. Rather, you should realize that each person is unique and that we all have an important function to perform in the Lord. God has apportioned to each believer a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. Service to him, service for him. But you know, that means even your faith is a gift of God. He provides that gift of faith for his own purpose. And before we move on, I want you to think about that. 
God bestows the faith required to obtain salvation. When you think about the fact we're not our own, when you think about the fact that we bring nothing to the dance but our faith, and then we have to actually admit that that's not even ours, he gave it to us. If we can, if we can understand that, we will begin to feel the humility that's necessary to move into the fullest of all positions in that relationship with God. Because then we drop everything about ourselves. And as we move towards God, there's nothing in the way. There's no distance between us because we didn't bring anything but ourself. No opinions, nothing we've made up, no, no delusion of our importance. Now, along with that faith, God then imparts what things are necessary for the saved person to fulfill the purpose for which God called him or her. Now think about how greatly vast and diverse the purposes of God are. How many different ways God enables his people to serve him. This means other than some overlap of abilities, each believer, each one of you that's a believer has been uniquely called and uniquely equipped to serve God. That is such an important thing to understand. And here's why it's so important. Because if you don't understand that, then maybe you're missing the very purpose for which you've been created. And the truth is, if you're missing the very purpose for which you were created, you're probably doing something that you're less equipped to do. And that doesn't mean we don't do things we're less equipped to do. But if that's all we do, then we come up short in the long run because we've missed that thing that God wants from us. Now, I can stand here and testify. I have spent a lot of years and a lot of energy trying to do things I am absolutely not gifted to do. And unfortunately, and this isn't a complaint, but it's a confession that church people can recognize. As a pastor, I'm expected to be good at everything. And I can tell you right now, you are in line to be disappointed because I'm not very good at much. And I've had to learn over the years as much as I can to steer myself into the very thing I was called to do. But that means those that are called to do the things that I can't in the body of Christ need to step up or those things will lack. Which means none of you are here by accident, and any one of you that are here this morning and are a believer are important. You're important to the kingdom. You're important to the things of God. You're important to this church. And that's what Paul really describes next. Look at verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul compares the church, which we could also call the body of Christ, to the physical body. And we know the physical body has many parts. And those parts do not all have the same function, thank the Lord. They each have a special use. So like a physical body, the church has many parts. The church, the body of Christ, has many members, but is never less just one body in Christ. And as members of the body of Christ, we are parts of one another. Meaning we are mutually dependent on each other. Such an important thing for us to consider. Because it's easy for someone to come in to the church in general, we'll call that, not this church, but the church. And it's easy for them to remain alone in a sense, not really seeing their relationship to others because of the relationship we collectively have with the Lord. 
And again, what happens is that individual misses out on what can come from that recognition, and the body as a whole misses out. And you can just imagine if you woke up one morning and your left arm said, I'm done. I'm going my own way. I don't need you anymore. So when we go places, I'm going to kind of sit over here and do my thing and let the rest of you do yours. But how important it is to have that left arm or that right arm or that finger, toe, foot, eye, tongue, whatever it is, doing what God designed it to do. And all and each of those parts doing exactly what God wants them to do. Can imagine the power of the body of Christ if that were the case. So, as a believer, you have gifts that differ according to the grace that was given to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, Each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Look at verse 6 again. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now that word gifts, if we take it from the Greek and then translate it literally, is the word charisma. It's funny how we use that word and how it kind of really fits here in an interesting way. The definition of that word is a divine gratuity, a spiritual endowment, a miraculous faculty. And, you know, it's interesting is when people talk about the gifts, we usually call them spiritual gifts, which they are. And if you're a student of the word, you'll say, well, yeah, the the gifts, they're taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're taught in Romans chapter 12, where we find ourselves today. And they're taught in Ephesians chapter 4. And the truth of the matter is the word gifts is only found here in chapter 12 of Romans. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's something called the spirituals. And in Ephesians chapter 4, it's something called the administrations. And I was trying to remember today, and I was remiss in going back to look if I did a spiritual gifts presentation when we went through 1 Corinthians this last time. I have to look, because if not, I'll pray about it, and maybe that's what we'll do next Sunday is go through that study. Um, Today is not a study on the gifts, although we are studying the gifts. But that actual word, gifts, which we translate as charisma, is only actually used here in 12, but it relates to what's talked about in Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. I hope that was clearer than mud. But But verse 6 says something very specific about these gifts. One, they differ according to the grace that is given, but it also tells us and instructs us, commands us, in my mind, let us use them. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So let's break down that verse. Each one of you that are a believer, that are here this morning, believer, listening later on tape, has received a gift. Those gifts are to be ministered to one another. And in doing so, you'll be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's an amazing thing. When you think about God's grace going out to his people, And all of the things, these gifts, all of this existing in God, existing in the Holy Spirit, who truly is the gift. When you walk in your gift, you are helping along the manifold grace, the entirety of the grace of God, because you're part of that. You're part of that. You're working with him in you and through you. I mean, think about the privilege. I mean, it's one thing that we were privileged by faith to be saved and not have to be the penalty of our own sin, that someone stepped in and did that for us. And God doesn't say, fine, now you're saved. Please, the bleachers, the field is mine. No, he says, ignore the bleachers. Stay on the field with me because we have a lot of work to do. And I'm going to make sure you're able to do that work with me as we co-labor together because I'm going to gift you with the exact power I need you to have to fulfill your role. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. What an amazing privilege. 
you know, Paul in his instructions to his young protege, Timothy, he said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you. I think there's a lot of neglect that goes on. And I don't think this church is spared of it. I don't think any church is spared of it. That some would just sit on their gift, maybe never knowing their gift, maybe doubting they have a gift, maybe never asking God to show them their gift. And then I laugh because I see people that exercise their gift beautifully and don't even know it's a gift. That's probably the best situation of all. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. So if you know your gift, or if you discover your gift, Paul says, stir it up. How do you stir it up? You use it. You use that gift. You walk in that gift. You exercise that gift. You ask the Lord to continuously fill you with his power so that that gift can go forward. And you know, you'll benefit from it, but let's be honest, it's not about you. It's about God first and then the body of Christ who receives it. And then eventually the world as the body is built up, edified, as Paul says in Ephesians, to go out and do the ministry. And see, what happens too often in the Western church, and it's the way the church has been formed, and I have thought and Man, I have thought and prayed and wondered over the years how I can change it, and I've never figured it out. But the Western church does this. The Western church does this. What does the Western church do? The Western church comes in. Everybody takes their seats. We pray for the Holy Spirit to fall on all of us, and then we say, okay, you guys shut up. I'm going to talk. Isn't it weird? You know, right now, we're sitting in the very worst of all adult learning styles. This is the worst way for adults to learn. You sit and be taught. Many of you can go back to your days in school and go, yeah, it didn't work. So there's got to be a way for the Spirit through each of us to work. Now, I see it in this church, and we do it beautifully. Do we do it as well as we could? No church does. But I see people ministering their gifts People come early and they fellowship. People stay late and they fellowship. People are always in this church looking out for one another, and it's a beautiful thing, and I couldn't be more thankful to witness it. And the gifts do come out. But I just think this needs to be a conscious effort. We need to take what we're, what we're hearing today and go, okay, let's start with the fact, do I know my gift? And if I don't, will I ask God to show me? Will I ask others to pray for me so that I might discover it? And if I can say, yes, I know my gift, or gifts, or gifts, am I doing the most I can with it? Not in my own strength, but am I letting the Lord work through that gift that's really his in my life so that others might benefit and that you might benefit in the long run? So those are the kind of questions that need to be asked. Those are things we need to explore and wonder about. You know, that verse I just read to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul saying, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. He says something interesting in the rest of that. He said, through the laying on of my hands. Now, in a, the time of the apostles ministered, they had powers that don't exist today. That's my opinion, and I, I feel pretty right about saying that. That actual apostolic office doesn't really exist, although the powers of it do. There is an apostolic gift, but I don't believe there are apostles today. And there's many church persuasions that have people they call by that title, apostle. Um, I personally don't agree with that. So I don't have the ability to pray a gift into you. But it seems the apostles could. But you know what? We do have the power to pray with you for the gift. And so I would encourage you today, if you're the one that's sitting there going, I just don't know what my gift is, never have, then why not come up after church and let us lay hands on you, not to impart that gift, but to join you in prayer to the Lord that he might show you that gift. Because he's already imparted it. And like I said, it could be gift, it could be gifts. I believe from my studies that everyone, each believer, has a primary gift. 
I believe we also have secondary. And here's the wonderful news. If you walk with the Lord, if you walk in the spirit and you remain open to his leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, he may use you today with a gift you never knew you had. And there's a chance he'll never do it again. Or he might. See, I believe God's hand is, stays over his people, knowing what he wants to take place, and he'll use the one who is available. He'll use the one who's open to be used. And if he needs you to do something that is so far from who you are, and you're open to him, he'll use you that day. He'll impart that gift to you as it's needed to be applied. What an exciting thing to consider that he'll equip you in that way, that he wants to equip you in that way. So Paul goes on to break these down, and he says, if someone has the gift of prophecy, let him speak a message from God to his people in proportion to the faith he possesses. And then he says, if your gift is ministry, which means service, then be involved in that act of ministry. Be involved in serving. Now, I want to say something about that gift. That is a specific gift. A person that has been gifted in ministry, gifted in service, which means it's like a supernatural dose of that particular thing. And the reason I'm emphasizing that here is because in a general way, maybe I should say more in a specific way, that gift is secondary at least for all of us. Because each one of you as a believer has already been called to serve. So if you're looking for what your gift is, start at least with the one that we all have. You, as a believer, have been called to serve. You, as a believer, has been called to minister. When you go to chapter 4 of Ephesians, where people say the other gifts, which are actually offices, are listed, it says all those offices, evangelist and pastor and teacher and prophet, all of those, all of those offices are there to do what? Equip the saints to do the ministry. See, that's another weird thing about the Western church. Everyone comes in and looks to the man up front, hopefully it's a man, up front, and says, well, there's the minister. No. I'm called to minister as well. I'm called to serve as well. But my actual calling, my actual calling is to teach you to serve, to teach you to to minister. You come in here to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. Are you ready for that? Only you can answer. He goes on, he says, if your gift is teaching, then be involved in the act of teaching. If you are one that God has gifted to exhort, which means encourage, then be involved in the act of exhorting. Boy, does the body of Christ need encouraging today. If you're an encourager, man, don't sit on it. People need that. People need to be encouraged. And you know, (laughs) because if you're not an encourager, then there's people, there's, there's, I mean, if a person doesn't get encouraged somewhere, um, it's just a tragedy. And really it should happen in the church. As God has gifted you to be a giver, then give with liberality. There's another one. We're all called to give but there's a specific gift for some to be a giver. And it says to do that with liberality, means with generosity, with sincerity. If you've been gifted to lead, then lead with diligence, which means eagerness and care. If you've been gifted as one who shows mercy, then show mercy with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. And the Greek word that translates into cheerfulness is the word that we get our word hilarity from. He wants us to be hilarious, hilarious about giving what we have. Now, Paul began this chapter with two amazing verses describing in black and white terms what God requires of us in order to align our lives with his divine will. In the second part of this chapter, which we just covered, we're further enlightened on how we are to live and move and have our being. The divine works through us as we engage the Holy Spirit and let the inspiration of God work through us by the gifts that he imparts. 
Now listen, this requires work on our part and an intentionality that is guided by passion and purpose. Because God wants to give these things, but we need to be receptive. There needs to be an intentionality in our prayer life to know what we are designed to do. There needs to be a purpose, understanding of our purpose in that, and a passion that arises out of that to do God's work along with him. Not to get before him, not to lag behind, but to let his power work in us. Now, to those things, we need to add our heart and our mind. I mean, let me ask a couple questions. What is the character of your Christian heart and mind? What are the traits that you manifest as you live your Christian life? And what things color or describe your Christian nature as you represent Jesus in your ordinary everyday life? God wants you to minister his gifts to your brothers and sisters in Christ. God wants you to build up his church, and he wants to reach a lost world through you by his will. So as we move forward, Paul gives guidance as to what should mark the life of a true Christian. Pick up with me in verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So there Paul starts with love. Makes sense because God is love. How can the Christian touch the world for God without making this key characteristic of his known? Now Paul, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, after he goes through all the gifts He says this at the very end of that chapter. He says, I show you a more excellent way. And then what follows in chapter 13 is what we've come to know as the love chapter. Many of you are familiar with it. You may have heard it at a wedding, if not in a teaching. If you've been here for a while, you've heard it in a teaching. And at the outset of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul shares this revelation. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So love is to be sincere and active. And that love that comes from God through a believer can't come into the world by any other means. We have that responsibility. We carry that to the world. So we're to share the real thing, not the world's version of love. Now I encourage you, not right now, but to spend some time in 1 Corinthians 13 to learn more about what that kind of love looks like. And I would encourage you, when you read through that description, which maybe you haven't in a while, maybe you never have, and you read through that description of what love is, I want you to read it a couple times, and then I want you to read it one more time, and I want you to substitute the name of Jesus for every time you see the word love. Because what love is, is what God is. And you can read those verses with Jesus' name where it says love, and you hear all of his characteristics, which makes sense. If he is love, then any description biblically by the hand of the Holy Spirit should sound like him. So we don't have to work towards loving. We just need to let the Lord love through us. Because the chances are if we try to do it, we're going to love like the world loves. But we want to love like God loves. So God needs to love through us. It says we are to love, but we're also to hate what is evil. And people say, oh God, you're a Christian. You can't hate. Really? Used properly, the word applies. We are to hate evil. Why? Because God hates evil. 
We are to detest all ungodliness and not tolerate wickedness, but hold on tightly to what is good. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. That's quite a list. It's a list that says to me that we should never be bored in the Christian life. We should never be sitting somewhere on a curb, staring down this empty street and going, I wonder what God wants me to do. As I've said many times, if you ever have that question, go to the word and start doing the thing that we've all been called to do. And the more that you do what we've all been called to do, you will discover what you have specifically been called to do. Because in that action of doing what we've all been called to do, he will hone you into the very thing he's designed you to be. And if you never knew what you were before that, you'll suddenly see that gift rise up. I'm going to read those verses again out of the Amplified Version. It says, Be devoted to one another with authentic brotherly affection. As members of one family, Give preference to one another in honor, never lagging behind in diligence, aglow in the spirit, enthusiastically serving the Lord, constantly rejoicing in hope because of the confidence, our confidence in Christ, steadfast and patient in distress, devoted to prayer, continually seeking wisdom, guidance, and strength, contributing to the needs of God's people, pursuing the practice of hospitality. In other words, seek God in his ways and then treat everybody you meet, especially in the body of Christ, in a godly way. And when you consider how well he treats us and the things that he extends to us, there's no shortage of what we each have to give to one another. No shortage. Pick up in verse 14. Some of you are going to become uncomfortable now. Bless those who persecute you. Anybody want to leave? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We look around our society today. We can tell just how many people are not Christians. And it would break my heart to find those I just qualified as not Christians to be Christians. Because we're supposed to be the difference. And the world has, as we've talked about a lot, has gotten so dark. And when you look at the way people are treating people, I mean, crime is just on a rampant increase. There's no regard, it seems right now, for civility. No respect of fellow man. And of course, the powers that are, are stirring every avenue of that so that it becomes worse, to divide us and keep us off balance. And so we, as those that represent Christ on earth, must be those that can do it differently. And man, is that hard. But boy, is it right. And so a lot of this, you may need to take to the Lord in prayer. You may say, Lord, take that wrong thought or that wrong heart out of me. Teach me, Lord, how I can be that person you want me to be. And I think there's a bigger thing at stake here, and we're going to talk about it, not very much in detail, but at least it's going to come up specifically. How do I, how do I navigate this world being godly and make sure that I'm still safe? Because right now it's becoming increasingly unsafe in certain environments, in certain locations. And I encourage each of you to make sure that you're walking very vigilantly these days. Because you could say to yourself, well, I live in little old Roseburg, and I don't have to worry about these things I see happening other places. That's a wrong answer. So you don't walk around worried. You don't walk around fearful. But I'm just encouraging you to be aware. To be aware of your surroundings. 
And I know in my personal life, for me and my wife, I am very, I consider very hard today where I'm going to go. Not because I'm fearful, but I'm not a fool. And so I just think that's important. And you have to make your own choice, but that's my opinion. You know, Jesus taught on this. We probably heard him speak as Paul reflected on it. Back in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Each of those things is on the rise. So we have to rise to that occasion with the character that Jesus has given us. Look at the next verse, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now I believe that's a command that's more about empathy than it is about sympathy. Now when we see, especially in the body of Christ, we see another that is hurting. Now, part of your reaction may be sympathy. You sympathize with them for the pain they're going through. But if we are truly one body, if we're one body, and let's go back to the human body, if there's something ailing in you, if you have a pain somewhere, the rest of your body is aware of it. The rest of your body adjusts to help that part that's hurting. And that could mean all kinds of things. I won't try to find an illustration. But it's the same in the body of Christ. If one of us is hurting, then we should be hurting along with them. We should be able to see ourselves in their position. That's empathy. The world has sympathy sometimes, but the world can't emphasize, empathize like we can or like we should. Look at verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on things, but associate with the humble Do not be wise in your own opinion. So here we're encouraged to live in harmony with one another. Not to be haughty, not to be conceited or focused on self or thinking you're exclusive. And it says we're to associate with humble people. It's a much better choice, believe me. People that are realistic or have a realistic view of themselves. And as we're told earlier in this chapter, do not overestimate yourself. You know, I think that's such a foundation to all of this relationship within the church. And it can, and it can seem like something we can just pass by. Okay, yeah, I'm not supposed to be proud. I'm not supposed to be conceited. I'm not supposed to think. Of, but you know, if every one of us was honest about who we are to ourselves, we'd all start on an even playing field. If we really believe that we were sinners saved by grace, and every one of us was, and to some degree still are, messed up, we would start at a different place. And we'd be able to yield to one another because you're just like me. I'm just like you. It's tough because it makes you vulnerable. And not everybody's going to give you back what you want. And if you've been in church long enough, you've been a believer long enough, you've probably experienced that. At some point, you probably tried to be transparent. You were totally honest. You laid your heart bare, and someone hurt you. I can testify. So does that mean you never do it again? Does does that mean you just never get to experience what God's asking us to do because you were hurt once? And I'm not minimizing that. I apologize for however the church has ever hurt you or church people. And a lot of us have scars. But we can't dwell there. We can't dwell there. Don't dwell there. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Now, this is a tough one. Someone's going to squirm in their seat. Repaying evil for evil is a really common practice in this world. We speak of giving tit for tat, repaying in kind, giving someone what they deserve. 
But a thirst for vengeance should not mark the lives of those who have been redeemed. Instead, they should act honorably in the face of abuse and injury in really all circumstances of life. I'm going to come back to that thought. Look at verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So as Christians, we should not be needlessly provocative or contentious. God's righteousness is not worked out by belligerence and wrath. Someone I read said we should love peace, make peace, and be at peace. And when we have offered, when we have offended others, or when someone has offended us, we should work hard for a peaceful resolution on the matter. You know, I bet there's some in this room that have relationships that are broken, probably maybe a lot of us. But as much as it depends on you, you need to find a way to make that right. You can't control the other person. You can't make them meet you halfway. You can't make them agree with you. You can't make it all right for them. But as much as it depends on you, you need to seek out that person and try to make it right. I have learned that lesson over and over in my life. It just doesn't do any of us any good to have that thing hanging out there because the enemy will use it. Look at verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, a simple summary of these two verses would be this. Take the high road and let God handle it. Stand back and let the wrath of God take care of it. We're told here that vengeance is God's prerogative. And we shouldn't interfere with what is his right. He's going to repay at the proper time in the proper manner. And here's what I want to say for those of you who are a little bit tight in your seat right now. Personal opinion. I do not believe this is a statement against self-defense. Some situations may call for self-defense but not retaliation in kind. And now you may say, isn't that a fine line? Well, I think the idea of retaliation in kind involves some pre-planning. Like I was hurt, something happened to me, and now I'm going to get him back. As opposed to being in a moment and needing to defend yourself or protect your loved ones. You may disagree with me, and you can, but that is where I stand because I think too often it's taught otherwise. And when you bring up the verses that seem to support what I just said, people are real fast to find a different way to explain them. When Jesus told his people to sell their cloak and buy a sword, he wasn't telling that so they could open a jar. He wasn't telling that so they could have a skewer at the next barbecue. He was telling them they were going out into a dangerous world, and now was the time you are probably going to have to protect yourself. The whole idea of turning the other cheek has a whole different cultural meaning of what's said. It's more about just a slight against a person and having to determine, do I really need to do anything about this? Or should I just show them the love of God, walk away, it's not worth the fight, it's not me, not worth my time to end up looking like them. So hopefully a couple of you are less tight in your seat right now. I guess the bottom line is this. We must have divine discernment and understand many offenses can simply be absorbed in forbearance and love. It's the truth. And then our final verse. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now this is a battle cry. Do not be overcome by evil. So how do we overcome evil with good? Well, we seek to be those that are overcomers in the Lord. And in that process, we allow him to overcome 
us to his own ends. If we want to overcome evil, then we need to be walking with God. We need to be walking in his ways. And that is the greatest deterrent to evil. Those of us have experienced in dark moments under spiritual attack what it means to speak the name of Jesus into that darkness and literally feel and sense and know that the evil has left. It happens. It's true. It's a power. We sing about his name, his great name. There's power in his name. That's how we overcome the darkness. That's how we overcome the evil. We speak his name, we walk with him, and we become conduits for his life by understanding what he's designed us to be. And I'm going to read it one more time. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's a good place to end. It's a great place to start. And it's a great place to stay. Amen. Worship and ushers can come up. As you come this morning to the communion table, I would just encourage you to understand maybe a little bit beyond your normal thinking that yes, we do celebrate at the communion table the sacrifice that Jesus made, the giving of his body for us, the shedding of his blood for us, but also realize that in that death and in that resurrection, Scripture tells us he gave good gifts to men. That was part of that whole process that took place in those three days, that he gave good gifts to men and women. And so as we celebrate this this morning, lift him on high, be thankful for his grace and his mercy, that he spared you from being a deadly sacrifice instead of a living sacrifice, but he raised you to that new life so that he can impart to you the gifts so that you could continue in the ministry that he started and co-labor with him here on earth. He has not left us out. He wants us totally included and involved, and he's made that possible. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for your instruction, Lord, for your encouragement, Lord, that you did give us gifts, and by those gifts you invite us to co-labor with you in your ministry. And Lord, I pray for the one or the two or the many that really just don't feel like they know how you've empowered them and how you have gifted them. And Lord, let us all know as believers that the first and greatest gift is the Holy Spirit, which you gave as you returned to your throne. You told us you wouldn't leave us as orphans. You told us that the Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us and lead us into all ways and always speak of you. And so Lord, he is the gift that was given. And we, you imparted that gift to us, and now by that gift in us, we are individually empowered to do things that you've called us individually to do so that collectively we would have a reward and we would have the richness. And so, Lord, help us to understand it. Help us to be willing to be part of that. And, Lord, you've given us so much. Let us not squander it. So we praise you today, Lord. We give you all honor and glory. We simply say we thank you and we love you. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.